Uh, earlier this week, I got thinking about Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry. I'll say it. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You bet. And I started dwelling on that idea of Mary. You know, it's wonderful that we have a Christmas greeting that says Merry Christmas. And what does that mean? That means, hey, have a happy, happy, Merry Christmas. We Americans lately are not acting that way, are we? You know, to be merry, what does it mean to be happy and merry and exuberant? We are to be merry and we're putting a blessing on people. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Have a merry Christmas. Yeah. Isn't that a neat idea? Yes. Just to really be happy. Just to be merry. Kind of carefree, joyful. What a wonderful concept. Isn't that neat? So. I had a moment of joy yesterday. I, I've been working hard on the FYI about God, and I had done the, the first video initially was the one on reasons to believe. But I look at it and I go, it, it needs to be redone. I need to have a better polish on it. I, I need to have a better order of it. So I worked and rewriting that, putting that together, and I finally got it re-recorded. And to me, it was such a big deal. Because the things that are shared in that video, I believe, are, are going to really catch many, many people. I think many people that we can send it to that normally either are not Christians or they're very nominal and they don't really see much benefit in faith. But I'm wowed by all these things that are shared. And I kind of promise at the beginning it's going to blow your mind, <laughs> and it does. There are so many amazing things in that. But I have great hopes it's going to be an evangelism tool that we can send. Uh, how many people are you in contact with? You can send a Christmas card and say, look here. Be blessed with faith, the gift of faith this winter, this Christmas. What I want to do, when, once I finally get it to a point really where it really wanted to be, it's been slower in coming than I wanted. I want us every week to look at the numbers and see how many people have seen these things and try to keep upping the numbers. One, one of the things I did too with reworking, I go, I need, you know, I learned in sales that there's no sense telling people all about a product unless you have a closure, unless you can close the sale. So I wanted, after all this evidence of God and the Bible and Jesus Christ to say, so here's, you know, God is real. These are things we need to know. So I invite you to come along with me to these lessons of the 14 most important things that God says in the Bible that we need to know. So I invite them on to the Foundation of Christian Teaching series. Anyway, when I got done with this, it's been weighing on my brain for a long time. And when I got done with it, I realized I just had a sense of joy. I was just happy. I, I just had a sense of joy. I, yes, finally got it more like I want. I, I, I never do anything perfect. I look at all of my messages, and just like a carpenter can always look at any project and say, well, it wasn't very good here or there, you know. That's why car carpenters invented trim, to cover up all their mistakes, you know. Isn't that true? And uh, it's just like cooks. My mom was bad at that. We tried to keep correcting her, but she was, she's a tremendously good cook. But whenever we sat down to a meal, she would start apologizing. And she says, well, the gravy wasn't quite as good. It's a little bit lumpy here or there, or the turkey was this. <laughs> I go, Mom, you don't need to apologize. Nobody else would recognize it, you know. So I never do things perfectly, but the information, I believe, is going to catch many, many people. And I think it's going to wow them to start going, Wow, well, there really is something of substance with believing in God. Look at these amazing facts. Look at how the Bible's been proven over and over. Look how Jesus Christ has been proven over and over. Wow, there's some substance to this. I need to know more about God. So I, the reason I redid the Reasons to Believe, because that's going to be the catch-all that can bring people into the rest of it. So when I got this finally done, good enough to where I feel, feel it will make the points that I want to make, 
I just had joy. And I got out of there and I just go, boy, I am so happy. This is done. I, and then I'm done, but it's done the way I want it to be. I, and then I realized something. Hey, I'm feeling joy. <laughs> I'm feeling joy. Isn't it good to feel joy? So I started thinking about the message and I go, and I had thought earlier about Merry Christmas. I go, okay, well, I need to, I need to teach on joy and, and dwell on joy. But we need to have joy in our lives. I'm just searching in the Bible, the Bible program. How many times does the Bible say to rejoice or have joy? 427 times. So it's throughout the Bible. Old Testament. You know, you think the Old Testament is being kind of a drab book. I mean, we have a wrong perception perception, but sometimes we have that perception. But God constantly tells us to rejoice and have joy, even in the Old Testament, all the way through. It is just neat that God is a God of joy. You, when we think of God on his throne, do we think him up there as a mighty God, the judge of the universe, going, whoo, I feel good, you know, this, I'm happy, you know, we, but God is a God of joy. And it's so neat, he commands us to have joy. We are to have joy. Um, in fact, the Bible tells us if we dwell in his spirit, some fruit is going to start developing in our lives. What are those fruits? Love, and the second one is joy. Wow. We are to have joy in our lives. And as I got thinking about joy, I started contrasting that with the way I've been, with the way I think our society has been lately. We just are not releasing ourselves to joy as much as we should, are we? But first of all, to know God is a God of joy. He loves joy. I know a lot of people have a real disconnect in trying to understand who God is and how he is like. And most nominal people or people not of faith think, well, God, if, if there is a God, he's just a big, harsh judge of the universe, you know. But he is a God that has love first and foremost, and he has joy. And that we as people that get to know God and dwell with him, we start producing the fruit of joy in our lives. When all is said and done and we get to heaven, one of the most remarkable things about heaven is going to be a release of joy. Just wonderful joy. They just, you know, our burdens are gone. We were there to celebrate God. God in his heart, his full expression is love and joy. And we will be free for eternity to experience great rejoicing and joy. What a neat, neat thing. So, in the process of developing these reasons to believe, connected with the joy, I started realizing what God has done for us. Not only with the whole Bible, with the history of mankind in the Bible, but the fact He sent His own Son in human flesh, to be our Savior, to be our friend, the one that intercedes for us with God the Father. So when we pray, we can envision another human being, Jesus Christ, how he was, his love, his grace, he's so approachable. And what a wonderful thing we have that God has done for us by sending us Jesus Christ. One of the segments in Proofs, that I love about Jesus Christ. There are many. One of the things I say too that Jesus is a man of history. He's probably more, more proven, more talked about even than Julius Caesar. Some historians said, have said one of the greatest uh, attested to historical facts is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because so many people, 500 people have seen him, People testified to him. 
And that while some people ignorantly say, well, maybe there wasn't, maybe it's just a myth that Jesus Christ ever existed, they don't do so on the basis of history. Jesus Christ is totally real. And it, it, it's just what a wonderful thing God has done. Uh, so, so one of the facts is that, that I loved, I did a paper in seminary about the miracles of Jesus that were attested to, not by believers, not by Christians, but others. And the reality is the first few centuries, nobody questioned if the miracles of Jesus happened. But they confirmed them that they happened by arguing, well, how did he do these things? And that confirms by others, by Romans and pagans and Jewish people. They talk about the, the miracles of Jesus, confirming them. So we know, but then they'll, they'll argue, you know, how they happened. But it confirms that Jesus in history was a wonder-working, miracle man. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, and he himself was raised. What a fantastic, solid thing God has given for us in our lives, along with all the other promises. But isn't that joyful? Yeah. That's at the core of our being. Yeah. It always is for Christians, but especially at Christmas. We highlight it. God sent his own presence in the Son as a human being for us to know to our, be our personal Savior. He's the Messiah of Israel. He's our big brother, the Bible says. He, he is the example of all things for us in faith. And so we can really be happy. We can really be joyful. That is such a joyful concept that we have with that. So, God has done so much for us in sending us His Son and that we are to rejoice. Paul said, rejoice always in the Lord. And again, he says, I will say rejoice. Because it's not a hard thing, it's not a laborious thing for me to say, but it is a safe thing for you to know. Again, he said, I repeat, rejoice. We need to get happy. So I think we need to start reassessing our joy in our lives, right? Because with the political season we've been through for the last three years or so, and the intensity and the day-to-day -day struggles we have, we've all gotten kind of, oh, me, oh, my, you know. But we are supposed to have joy. We're supposed to be happy. And, and uh, when we say Merry Christmas, you go, if we really mean that, what does that mean? Carefree, happy, joyful, merry. Woo! We're, 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 we're partying. We're happy. You know? So we really do need to reassess our joy. And I'm talking to myself, of course. But we need to reassess that we Christians, as an individual, we need to have joy. Because of the fruit of the Spirit, the second one listed is joy. Well then, if we're not having that, we need to make some adjustments, right? And I think we can all figure out what are those adjustments. I'll let you work on that with me. We can all think about that. But what do I need to do? Well, first of all, I think I need to have my faith loom a little more large. Um, I need to put things in better perspective. I need to daily think on, meditate on what God has done for me and where I'm headed for eternity. And I need to have joy. And no matter what is going on, God is always in charge and we're going to, for the, for the next million trillion years, we're going to be living in joy and we can just say, I can be happy. No matter what happens, we can have joy. And I think if, if you ever meet somebody, if you meet a, a group of people you want to hang around with, if you want to hang around a bunch of sourpusses, uh, is that going to be as, as appealing as hanging around someone that just is up and joyful? It, it's a witnessing tool for you, really, to be happy. Really to have some joy. So let's take stock of if anything's holding down our joy, if we are practicing joy or not. And let's start getting that into our lives, into our attitudes, into our words. And, and uh, let's have joy. Amen? That sound good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's good. Because I don't think the liberals come off as a joyful people, right? The liberals are, are always complaining. Everything's always terrible. And we need to destroy everything that is good and works that are, that's right and normal. We need to bring everything into poverty, thing, it, poverty everything into d despair. And if they do have any expressions, it's about perversion. It, it's about discontentment. It's about anti-God, not pro-God. They, they constantly are cutting out any roots of joy that might be present in their lives. So as the world gets weirder, it's going to be all the more appealing if we are a people of joy. Yeah. Not faking it, mm -hmm. getting the root in us that, they're really, that we can really be joyful. Let's be happy. Let's, let's be full of joy. Yes. Uh, going back to the Old Testament, for instance, when God brought the people of Israel into the land, he instituted the Old Testament law. And one of the things he said, now three times a year, I want you to have festivals. They're going to last seven days, and then they will begin on the next Sabbath day. So ultimately it was eight days. But he said, I want you to have festivals for different reasons, doing different things. But in every single one of them, he told them that they were in these times to rejoice. Let me read uh, some examples here. And I think this is one of the festival of booths where they recall how God brought them in the Exodus and all that. Leviticus 23, 40. You shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows on, of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord for seven days. I think it's Billy, Billy Brim. She was saying that she was in Israel, and uh, Israel was having a festival of one of these feast days, and she was sitting there grinding away at a desk, and a Jewish came, lady came along and said, well, what are you doing? We're supposed to be out here rejoicing. And she, the Jews on those days will come out, and they'll dance in the street, and they will rejoice, because it's one of those festivals. Three times a year, God called them to have seven to eight days Cut off the work, rejoice in God, and literally rejoice. Dance in the streets, have music, timbrel and dance, and joy, and speak, and act, and be joyful. That's Old Testament. God commanded them to have joy. Now then when he talked about um, that when they came into the land, they were to... Uh, find the place that God was going to point out where the temple was to be, which we now know looking backward. Um, it was in Jerusalem. And they were to have the temple there. And we know Solomon, David got all the preparations together and then Solomon built the temple. This is what God said then that they were to do when they came to worship God. Deuteronomy 12, 7, at the temple. We would say, when you come to church, uh, and there you shall eat before the Lord your God. Bring your potlucks. No. <laughs> you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice. You know, it's interesting how we read the Bible, but we kind of just miss some things. When you think about the God, God instituting the temple, the first thing we think of is, yeah, that's where we were supposed to go to rejoice. Anyway, it's interesting how we can keep reading the Bible and keep seeing it again and more and more. But we were to rejoice. You shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake. So it's not just at church, but everything you're doing in your life, you're to rejoice in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. A few verses later, talking about coming to the temple. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters. And then uh, later on again, he says, But you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place that the Lord your God will choose, 
you and your son and your daughter, and you shall rejoice before the Lord again in all that you undertake. So, God wants us to be rejoicing. And um, there again, I think we need to assess as a church. We need to have joyful times in church. Yeah. It isn't it sad when we think back over the last couple hundred years, when people picture church, they picture being very stoic, very quiet, very boring. Kids don't want to go to it. But if you have dancing and celebration and banners and dance and food and, and you're rejoicing and singing, I think they might start having a different feeling about church. So Lord, help us to get there in your church. But we are to remember and we are to be joyful for all that God has done. When we go to our daughter Tabitha's house north of Kansas City, she has on her fireplace mantle just a little box saying, and I thought, with all that Tabitha's been through, she went through some really hard times with divorce and all that, but God has very richly blessed her in every way. But anyway, the little placard there uh, above the fireplace says, I still remember how I prayed for all the things I now have. Isn't that good? I still remember now how I pray for all the things I now have. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that awesome? And we've often said we need to remember, we need to make notes about how God answers our prayers and gets us through. There's so many times in life you go, Oh Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get past it. I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. I don't know how I'm going to get my health back. I don't know how I'm going to do this or that. And God gets us through, and then we forget. And people always do that, but we need to remember all that God has done. So we celebrate Christmas and the announcement to the shepherds, right? The angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you great sort of good news, sort of. <laughs> no. It said, behold, I bring you news of a great joy. Isn't that neat? I bring you news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I had always wondered, why, why would, you know, you got farmers out in the field at night. I'm, I'm a farmer's kid, I think a farmer's but. You have the shepherds out at night and all the host of angels come and light up the skies and pronounce, the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. And I go, that is really neat. Not that I'm just disparaging shepherds, but why did the angels announce the birth of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world to the shepherds? Then a couple years ago we heard in Bethlehem, nearby Bethlehem, the Levites that had to prepare sacrificial lambs for the temple had a large birthing operation, raising sheep to, because they had always had to have a year old lamb that was pure and, and bring it to Jerusalem. So Bethlehem was a place where the shepherds watched over the birthing lambs that would be used for sin offering. How appropriate that saying, the, the, the lamb to the shepherds. Now the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, that is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, has been born tonight in Bethlehem. And I go, that is pretty cool. Why God would tell the shepherds that were watching over the birthing lambs that were ultimately to be the sacrificial lambs at, in Jerusalem, that the number one lamb that takes away the sin of the world was born in their town tonight. Isn't that neat? That is so very, very exciting. So joy is to be a part of our regular lives. Paul, in talking to the Romans in, in the... Uh, chapter 12, 
He reviews the things that we as Christians should be doing all the time. He says this, Romans, starting at Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. These are the kind of things we should be doing. And of course, we highlight now the, the we should rejoice because we have a great hope. A good time to share our joy is when we come together in church, right? It's so neat to see you. It's so neat to get together. It's so neat to share about the uh, everything, you know, the struggles and pray together. And then one person said this, joy that is shared is joy that is doubled. It's always neater to be able to share some joy you have with others. Isn't that neat? So when we come together, we can share our testimonies, whatever good thing's happening, we can share our joy together too. I thought that was a pretty neat saying. Paul had said, rejoice in hope. Ultimately, regardless of what happens here now on earth for the next few years, we have all of eternity, right? Yes. And every once in a while, I think, I always start crying when I say this. But the old hymn we used to sing growing up in the Baptist church, and there's other churches too, uh, the old hymn, when we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven, let's just sing it. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. 